Okay, we are on the record. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 6th, and the time is 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and the Board of 80 County Commissioners are in session once again for our department budget presentations. And they have been um, really enlightening, and uh, we appreciate all that have come before the ones today. Um, we're going to go ahead and I'll turn it over to Phil, and he is helping us navigate our way through these. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, fortunately, I, I heard Commissioner Lachiano remarking, we are towards the end of our binders and the end of our presentations this afternoon. We'll hear from the final departments that uh, we've been awaiting to present. Um, so specifically, we have Parks and Waterways, uh, followed by Expo Idaho and the Fairgrounds, and then Weed Pest and Mosquito. Um, at that point, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and you guys had requested, and so uh, uh, Meg Leatherman will give us an overview of the master's facility plan and kind of where that fits into all this, as well as a review of the prioritization regarding the CIP and extraordinary operating expenses, those things, so you kind of have those in mind. And then after that, Kathleen and I will kind of walk through what the next steps, what's the process going to look like moving forward, both for you guys as well as for the public, so that we can... Uh, kind of plan the head. We'll, we'll take next week off from any hearings uh, and then return on June 17th. And so we'll walk through a lot of that detail and answer a number of questions to hopefully kind of tee that up for the next steps uh, okay. after that. And I should mention uh, Commissioner Laciando is present um, and Commissioner Visser is absent today. Okay. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, if we're ready, I'll mm -hmm. turn it over to Kathleen to introduce Scott Coburn. Up, Kathleen. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Close here. Um, are our screens going to get up and running here? I'm sorry? Oh. Are your screens not on? Yeah, actually, let's hold on a second. They're not. No DP signal, I'm going to say. Yeah. Luckily, we have these IT here. IT, <laughs> come on up. Let him come to the work here. Other duties as assigned, okay. It, mine appears to be working. There's a button hidden behind where it like, writes with a green button. Oh, there's a button hidden. Yeah, there's a hidden button. Ah. Okay. The hidden so button. Know. The hidden button trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. Thank you, Antonio. So we still have these that don't have anything on them. Uh oh. Not connected. We need more help. <laughs> as exciting as this is in person, I can only imagine what it's like <laughs> online. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing it's the last day. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is just yet another opportunity for you to convey your budget through song. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Scott, song? <laughs> it's, on now. it's on now. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. We good? Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All righty. Thank you. All right. Scott Koberg is the Director of Parks and Waterways. The Parks Fund accounts for the operation and maintenance of Barber Park, the Barber Park event... Event, education and Event Center, the annual Boise float season, including equipment rental, concession and shuttle services, several miles of green belt pathway, the Oregon Trail Recreation Area, the Ada Eagle Bike Park, Hubbard Recreation Area, and Victory Wetland. The Parks Director is a designated county representative for the Ridge to Rivers Partnership, which manages nearly 200 miles 
of multi-use recreation trails in the Boise foothills. Waterways accounts for the installation, operation, and maintenance of over 100 recreational dock strings at 16 recreational sites and four access ramps at Lucky Peak Lake. That encompasses uh, portions of three counties, so Ada, Boise, and Elmore. Waterways is responsible for the management of the county vessel fund and provides monetary support to the boater safety and patrol programs initiated by the Ada County Sheriff's Marine Patrol. So getting started in front of you is the Parks Department budget. They are a special levy fund within the 3% cap. Budget for FY20 submitted at 1273826 an increase of 361,085. Operating budget 806-333, personnel budget 467-493. This budget does include supplemental requests of 470,499. Below you can see the uh, changes in the requests. There's one supplemental request for personnel and PBS for one special salary adjustment. And there are six supplemental requests on the operating side Titles include Phase 2, Red Hawk to Avamore, Wood Chipper and Used Bus, Greenbelt Damage Repair, Vault Toilet and uh, Entry Signage, Mini Skid Steer, and Increase in Operational Expenses Across All Parks Departments. Waterways is a special um, revenue fund, self-supported, 100% of the revenues support their expenses. Budget for FY20 submitted at 176000 a decrease of 58,748, operating budget 88,485, personnel budget 87,515, below uh, the changes to that budget. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Coburg to give you more information on these budgets. Thank you. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, and thank you, Kathleen. Madam Chair, Commissioner Laciando, Mr. McGrain, thank you for the opportunity to present the Ada County Parks and Waterways fiscal year 2020 budget. Uh, you'll see that I will provide a little bit more um, background information on some of those budget categories that Kathleen just provided the overview regarding. And I like to showcase what we provide for the taxpayers of Ada County as public servants in our department and really elaborate on those properties that were mentioned previously in the introduction. The guidelines we were provided with to prepare our fiscal year 20 budget were to convey our challenges, constraints, and needs, highlight our accomplishments, describe how you have utilized and executed past budgets, uh, elaborate on supplemental requests for personnel and operating, and then identify the CIP request and describe those in a little bit more detail. I'll tell you right off the top, the convey your challenges, constraints, and needs uh, you'll see some of that throughout this presentation as well as the second two bulleted items. I will highlight those um, throughout the course of this presentation. Challenges like many other Ada County departments are an increase in population and a demand for services that we're seeing across all our facets of uh, property management. And meeting that level of expectation for service is, is always challenging um, when you have the constraints of certain properties that really are in need of uh, injection of capital. So. Um, once again, I'll hit on all these items throughout the course of the presentation. Very briefly, um, the mission statement and vision statement of our department, um, fairly verbose. I won't go into too much detail here, but you can read those at your leisure if you'd like. Um, overall, our intent is to really provide that tremendous level of service uh, to the community and to the visiting public to Ada County. Um, and, and I will go ahead and read the vision statement to provide a balanced approach to outdoor recre recreational activities through the careful stewardship of land and waterway resources in support of our community's current and future needs. Overview of our department, as Kathleen pointed out, uh, we're responsible for the management of all Ada County owned uh, parks, open space, trails, and waterways properties. Um, it also includes some properties that we do not own. Um, first and foremost is Barber Park, which are our department headquarters. Um, three primary components identified through bulleted items here, but. Grounds, trails, natural resources, facilities, and equipment all fall under our umbrella, as well as the faci uh, rental facility operations for the raft and tube season uh, that we orchestrate. And the Education and Event Center, Boise River Greenbelt, Lucky Peak, uh, Lake, Public Docks and Boat Ramps, Victory Wetland, Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area, Eighty Eagle Bike Park and Public Recreation Area, Oregon Trail Recreation Area, 
Ridge to Rivers Trail System and Idaho Oregon Snake River Water Trail. I present these to you in, in a list. I'll go into detail in the next several slides. Starting with just an overview, kind of the county, um, if, you, if you can follow my cursor, this is the outline of Ada County. This is a, a bit of an overview of, of just where our properties that we own and manage are located. This is actually not an all-inclusive list, but it's the primary ones I'm going to describe today. Number four there is our location, um, where our headquarters are, where all our staff resides, where all our maintenance and operations occurs from. So we're required to, you know, cover a, a huge portion of the county as the crow flies, you know, we're 18 miles um, from some of these sites, uh, all the way to Lucky Peak, identified as number seven there, and number one would be the Ada Eagle Bike Park. We cover a lot of ground for the citizens of Ada County. Starting with Barber Park, just the overview of Barber Park, you can see here, um, this is property, if you imagine you own a, a parcel of property, say it's in your neighborhood and it's your yard, <laughs> and your neighbors see it every day, you know, that's similar to how Ada County uh, owns this Barber Park. It's a very forward-facing public involvement park. Uh, we do have a native cottonwood forest. We do have river frontage property. We also have a lot of landscaped areas, buildings, facilities, grounds, um, trails, uh, greenbelt pathway through two different portions of the park, um, signage, everything that goes with Barber Park uh, falls under our umbrella. <clears throat> As mentioned, this is our department headquarters. Ada County has actively owned and managed Barber Park since the 70s. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, there was a, uh, about 15 years ago, there was a, a major reconstruction of Barber Park through a master plan, which resulted in portions of a master plan being implemented. Those portions would include what you see on the left there, which is our Ada County uh, Parks and Waterways Administration Facility. Uh, those are solar tubes on the roof. Uh, and on the right is our raft and tube rental facility and storage. Um, that's a green roof on top. It is a LEED certified silver facility, and that's where really all of your Ada County Parks and Waterways operations originates from. As mentioned, the floating season, parking, river floating amenities, concession, restrooms, shuttle, um, everything that uh, we're, we're sort of known for operating the float season, and, and really it's much more complicated than that. Um, but I choose to highlight it here so you understand the volume of people you may see, um, all the pieces and parts we're responsible for. You'll see that county license plate on that shuttle bus. As I mentioned during my staff meeting this morning, uh, four of those buses uh, are owned by us as a department. Those are 80 county buses. The bottom left, you'll see um, what we consider our overflow parking field. You'll see a request um, through the CIP later on in my presentation to enhance that parking facility due to the volume of traffic we receive. And just to give you another understanding of the volume and the kind of the sort of orchestrated chaos that occurs in Barber Park for about 70 days during the summer. You know, we have staff that arrive before sunset um, or before sunrise, I should say, and after sunset, we're there closing the gates. Um, that's 70 days, seven days a week. Um, we're there um, running a facility that uh, serves the public and visitors to Ada County. The revenue you can see there from 2018, um, our revenue share, which we have a vendor that operates that, we have a revenue share of the equipment and shuttle. Our share was $201,633 last year. Parking, we do not share that revenue. Uh, that is $161,921 from 2018 in the Snack Shack, which is a small portion of revenue related to the float season. We, um, we broke every record that we've ever had in the park last year by over 40%. So every single day revenue total that we, the thresholds were primarily set from 4th of July dates or from uh, dates in 2015 when we had a huge volume of folks visiting from the uh, Far West Regional Soccer Tournament. We broke every record last year through the roof, off the charts um, for parking, for shuttle rental. Um, there were 14 of the top 15 single day gross revenue dates. Uh, those records, 14 of the 15 were set last year. The only other one was a, a lingering 4th of July single, single day. So every weekend now is like the 4th of July in Barber Park in terms of volume. Um, and we take a lot of pride in what we do in terms of pro providing that service for citizens and visitors. One of the great things about it is you see this 
sort of mass of people. This is a typical weekend. Um, our office facility is located just in the background there. So this is what you would find if you came to visit us on a weekend in the summer. Great thing about that, not all of those folks are Ada County taxpayers, and yet they're bringing money to Ada County, paying for parking, in some cases, um, renting shuttle equipment. So we leverage what funding we're provided with from the general fund to generate additional income for Ada County and its citizens, and then we inject that revenue back in those local assets for the community. So it's a really tremendous uh, operation. Scott, I just have a question on those revenues. Are they reflected in the waterways or the parks budget? Those would be, Madam Chair, reflected in the parks budget. Those were not anticipated revenue for fiscal year 20. Those are um, last season's revenues, so the 2018 season's revenues. You would find those in, in our FAB program for what we accrued over 2018. Moving on, the Education Event Center also is located just behind our office in Barber Park. Um, in 2018, we had 126 event days at the Barber Park Education and Event Center. Uh, the revenue generated from that is $108,216, $108, $216. Um, that, that's hard to say, $108,216 is I believe what I meant to say in event bookings. And then the alcohol sales, we have an exclusive alcohol provider, so we have a revenue share. Um, with that particular um, revenue stream. We also serve the community tremendously in this regard with the event center. You see from the photos here, again, very forward-facing department. Um, we staff uh, every single event um, with an event attendant. We handle every event from the first phone call all the way through the closing of the event, closing of the contract with the event. We clean the facility and the furniture belongs to us. Um, but that is your Barber Park Education and Event Center. Weddings, receptions, retirement parties, auctions, um, proms, just about anything, awesome fundraisers. Uh, this is an 80 county facility that you should be proud of. I'll jump right into the Boise River Greenbelt. We have had active management since the 1980s. 80 county now owns approximately 12 miles, um, owns, managed, uh, or, or is licensed, or has easement agreements for about 12 miles. So management responsibility of Greenbelt. What we have done with future former budgets, I should say, two CIP projects that we completed in fiscal year 17 and 18 were the Warm Springs Mesa and Penitentiary Canal Greenbelt projects. We turned that CIP money into tremendous success. Uh, ribbon cuttings and big announcements are made when we do those types of things. Um, they were uh, all told almost four miles total of Greenbelt repaired um, and replaced. Uh, give you an understanding of what that might look like on the ground from your top and bottom portions. When we're, that's an 80 county facility on the top and, and we're responsible for management of that, whether it's in that condition or when we're given that CIP and we're able to make that improvement and now we can actually manage that asset. Madam Chair, uh, Scott, just a, a thank you to you and the former board um, because my mom walks on that stretch of Greenbelt every day and I'm very appreciative um, that I'm not getting phone calls from her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Lachianda. Uh, a couple of testimonials, including that one we just received from your mother. Um, <laughs> so, hi, Scott. bravo for the great job and result on the section along Warm Springs that I first biked yesterday. It's one of the better stretches of Greenbelt upgrading I've seen in 16 years and 47,000 miles of biking in Boise. Not only the surface, but the lane markings are top notch. Thanks for providing this enhancement to biking in Boise, David Hurwitz. The second one, and he may be a little bit, um, he, Ron Freeman is a former 80 County employee, but you see it, it's, it's an interesting comment at the bottom there, but just wanted to say, good evening commissioners, just wanted to say a big thank you for the Greenbelt work. I was able to ride from my home in Eagle out to Lucky Peak, and the county portion east of the Warm Springs Golf Course was great. I was thinking to myself, once I got to the new portion, I wish Boise City's Greenbelt was as nice as the county stretch. A couple of years ago, you would never even imagine hearing that statement, but we have since turned the tables on Ada County Greenbelt stretches when given capital to support those. So, um, In terms of uh, awards for those as well, I mean, those are testimonials and those are great. They're feel good. We also were, we received the award for uh, American Council of Engineering Companies first place in the 2018 Engineering Excellence Special Projects Division. And we did in 2018 uh, receive the Compass Leadership in Motion Award, uh, Leadership in Government category, uh, 
Commissioner, former Chairman Case and I received that award at the Compass Luncheon in December um, for that project. So the county actually um, was, the, was the, the nominee and award winner for the leadership in motion category for these projects. In that letter that uh, Matt Stoll um, contributed, just again, an, another uh, accommodation in, in terms of the award, um, explaining how this project exemplified true leadership in government through the coordination with Bureau of Reclamation and Boise Project Board of Control. Um, thanks to your efforts, the rebuilt pathways provide a high quality regional connection to the greater Boise River Greenbelt system and regional recreation and open space areas while promoting increased public health and supporting the high quality of life we all enjoy in the Treasure Valley. Thank you, congratulations on behalf of myself and the entire Compass Board of Directors. Moving on, Lucky Peak Lake. Lucky Peak Lake, as mentioned, covers portions of three counties. There's 16 recreational sites on the lake. You'll see in the bottom right-hand corner the map for Lucky Peak Lake recreation areas, Ada County's seal. Um, also, the first number for contacting for further information is Ada County Parks and Waterways. This map was created by the Ada County IT Department. Um, the partnership is a tremendous local, state, federal partnership with Ada County, uh, Idaho's Department of Parks and Recreation, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Our involvement has been active management of the dock facilities since the early 1990s. As mentioned, we currently have 100 dock strings at 16 recreation sites spread throughout the lake, including uh, Boise and Elmore counties. We also have four of the five ramp sites occupied by Ada County dock facilities. Those are Barclay Bay, Turner Gulch, Max Creek Park, and Roby Creek Park. The only one we do not, did not until this year have representation with docks was Spring Shores. Um, and as mentioned, we also contribute a portion of our funds. Once again, this is part of the County Vessel Fund received from the Idaho Safe Boating Act, distributed to Idaho Department of Parks and Recreations, and then distributed further to the counties based on the area of recreation. This is from uh, registration for boats from whole identification numbers. We do have two vessels. We have a, a, a jet boat, um, which is a Custom Weld Storm 21-foot jet boat, and we have a 30-foot Almar um, craft that has a crow's nest on it as well for doing this. Uh, again, I mentioned the local state partnership, extremely effective. And then we've also, in the past um, about five years, been awarded, Ada County's been awarded $135,000 from the Waterways Improvement Fund, most recently for implementation of a low-profile dock project at Spring Shores. This is an additional partnership and collaboration with Southwest Idaho Sailing Association, and, <clears throat> pardon me, in the city of Boise, Parks and Recreation. What we did is we purchased these low profile docks to help separate motorized use from hand launch use at Spring Shores Marina. Um, this is for small sailing vessels, stand up paddle boards, those types of things. Promotes boater safety at the lake. And then also the collaboration with CISA and the city of Boise is that it's being integrated into a community um, recreation and education program through Boise City's community programming. So they'll be educating young kids on how to sail at Lucky Peak shortly. Once again, I like to, you know, we don't tend to beat our own chest and celebrate our victories too much, but um, here is a, a post that is from the Lucky Peak Dam and Lake um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official Facebook page. Uh, it does show a photo that says docks provided by 80 County Parks and Waterways. Um, I'll go ahead and read that top one so you, this says it better than I could say it. Uh, it says, did you know that every single dock except those at Spring Shores Marina and the plastic swimming docks on Lucky Peak are provided and maintained by Ada County Parks and Waterways? Over 500 dock segments maintained by just two workers. Most of those dollars originate with vessel registration fees designated for use in Ada County, then are leveraged, often leveraged with competitive matching grants from the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation Waterways Improvement Fund, and occasionally leveraged with comp competitive Federal Clean Water Act grant funds. This is how your parks departments get creative and stretch their limited resources to the absolute end to provide the best value to you. We are grateful for Ada County Parks and Waterways continued support throughout the years. If it weren't for partnerships like these, for boaters, Lucky Peak Lake would be a dramatically different place today. We do take a lot of pride in what we do up there. Jump right into Victory Wetlands. We've had active management since 1997. This is another 
collaboration and partnership effort with ACHD. Ada County owns the northern portion of the property. ACHD owns the southern portion of the property. It's a stormwater basin and wetlands, um, small park with educational kiosks and a concrete pathway. It's very close to the regional library as well. <clears throat> we're excited about these new signs in the bottom right hand corner that we're collaborating right now with ACHD to implement on site this year. <clears throat> The Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area we've actively managed since 2003. This is a, through a partnership with the Idaho Department of Lands. It's a lease agreement. The county holds a lease agreement for recreation uh, at Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area, about five miles as the crow flies south of the interstate off of Eagle Road. Uh, what we have there are 377 acres of open space with trails, parking, trailhead, multi-use trails, and kiosk and restroom that was installed in 2014. The 80 Eagle Bike Park, this was a static map that we did implement on site. You'll see the logos on the right. Uh, City of Eagle, 80 County Parks and Waterways and the landfill. This is a portion of the landfill <coughs> property that was carved off for recreation several years back and has since become one of the most popular parks in the valley. It's the only bike park in the valley currently. Uh, we also did create an interactive map with the assistance of our 80 County IT department. You can now zoom in and, and do all kinds of fun things with the the trail system out there, and this was actually the template that was used to build this same kind of feature for the Rich Rivers trail system. Involvement in this park dates back to the uh, early 1990s. The counties have had active management since 2014. The lease was canceled. The county took over about 310 acres of open space management plus 10 and a half miles of trail management. Um, there are a lot of unique facilities on site. There are the only mountain bike specific downhill only trails in the valley here. Um, this is, again, I'll mention one of the most popular forward facing parks that we manage. We do celebrate events with ribbon cuttings out there as well. Very great, you know, excellent community events, opportunities for collaboration when we build new trails that are meant for um, new, uh, new uh, users in the community. In this case, this was a Snoop Loop ribbon cutting. It's a trail that's designated solely for small children to learn how to mountain bike. Again, the only trail like that in the valley. Oregon Trail, also known as Oregon Trail Recreation Area. Active management since 2010. 80 County actually built this facility through grant um, assistance and a lot of cooperative agreements. The grant assistance came from the Idaho Department of Transportation. 80 County purchased 25 miles, uh, or I'm sorry, 25 acres at the trailhead and also 14 additional acres south of the trailhead um, on either side of a BLM piece of property. Currently, there's about five miles of multi-use trails, access to 320 acres of open space. And the really cool aspect of this park is that it's a cultural and historic uh, preservation area where you can park, big buses can park and unload kids and learn about the Oregon Trail. This is near Highway 21. Once again, 2018, this site did receive the 80 County Historic Preservation Council uh, Award um, for the County Treasurer Award, um, selected for properties that, that, uh, that is a site or structure that adds to 80 County's heritage. So we celebrate those successes and what we've done with past budgets. Rich to Rivers, again, tremendous local state federal partnership. Uh, those are the partners listed there, 80 County seal is included 200 miles of multi-use uh, trails in the foothills and i am the designated representative for 80 county on the rich rivers partnership mou agreement most recently what we've done with this partnership is we've integrated 80 county's red hawk property near hidden springs into the trail system with a supplemental uh, request that we made last year where we actually completed about two and a quarter miles of trail twenty thousand dollars under budget to create the landslide loop trail, which is a tremendously now popular newest trail to the Rich Rivers trail system. Um, and again, it incorporates 80 County's Red Hawk property. Uh, we made it happen. It's really the phase one of uh, hopeful two phases of a project. And lastly, Idaho Oregon Snake River Water Trail is a 206 mile water trail that extends from Glens Ferry all the way to Farewell Bend in Oregon. Um, this is an effort that began several years before 2014. We've been involved since 2014. Reach three and four cover about 22 miles of 80 County Southern border. And what the opportunities that exist with the Idaho Oregon Snake River Water Trail Coalition is to enhance and improve recreational access sites, 
um, and also improves improve commerce in some of the smaller towns along the river. This was a Scott, national, sorry. Well, um, the assets along this trail, will they only be accessible by water or are they going to be accessible by land as well? Madam Chair, that's a great question. So primarily a water trail, these originated back in the East Coast and this particular water trail um, came to fruition with a grant from the National Park Service. The water trail is primarily intended to be used as an experience on the water with interpretive sites, load and launch sites throughout the course of the river in different reaches. The, the additional possibility of enhancing commerce along the river really exists as you get further downstream on the snake where you have riverside communities that have an opportunity to bring tourism from the ramp into town to invest in you know, lodging and food and those types of things. So there's really kind of a, a building interaction with the water trail, but a water trail in and of itself is intended to be enhanced recreation of that facility. So. Follow-up question. Sure. Um, so this was initiated by a grant. Um, did they pay for 100% of this or was it matching? Madam Chair, that's a good question. So this was originated through a National Park Service grant that was acquired by actually the, our, our counterparts to the, to the west, the Canyon County uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. And um, no, there were matching funds provided at, at various points in time. At this point, what Ada County has contributed is really technical assistance and partnership support. We haven't developed uh, major facilities on the Snake River. However, we have supported um, you know, the enhancements that were made more, most recently by Idaho Power at the Swan Falls Dam area where they provided new campsites, new load and launch areas, and we're working with Fish and Game on a new um, designated boater access site downstream. So, Thank you. sure. I'll hit on our social media outreach briefly. In addition to all those properties that we do manage, we currently have five social media pages. Facebook pages is really all we're, we're currently doing. We have a Parks and Waterways Facebook page, a page for 80 Eagle Bike Park, a location specific page again for Barber Park, um, the Barber Park Education and Event Center specific page. And then the most popular is the Float the Boise River Facebook page. Give you an example of the popularity. A couple years ago, we posted a video, short video during the flood. And that post uh, was viewed 75,000 times. Um, and had 896 shares. And uh, so we do have a tremendous outreach opportunity with that page. Um, furthermore, more recently, last year, we do make the announcement for when we open the float season on this page. It is the, the source for all official announcements related to the float season. That opening day post reached 282,416 people, shared a bunch, and we had a lot of reactions, a lot of comments, and uh, we're increasing our page likes every day. I think we got about 200 this week. The plan support for what we do, Sorry. everything. Scott, operationally, who do you have? That's a lot of social media to manage. Who on your team is, is managing all that outreach? Madam Chair, Commissioner, I would say I'm probably doing about 90% of that. Um, we formerly did rely a bit on our uh, public information officer from the county to supplement that. But um, when it comes to the Education and Events Center, my booking and events coordinator um, does social media outreach and posts occasionally. Um, also, my open space and trails coordinator will do outreach related to Eight Eagle Bike Park. Um, but it's really just existing staff, sort of other duties as assigned. We try to get our messaging collaborated before it goes live. Um, but we don't have a designated person for that currently. Thank you. Sure. As I mentioned, we don't, you know, we do all these through the support that we have received and has been documented through plans. Um, one of those plans would be the uh, 2017, still relevant, I'm sorry, 2007 Parks Open Space and Trail Plan for our department. Although it's a bit dated, it's still relevant. Additionally, the, what yielded from that was the findings and recommendations from the Ada County Open Space Task Force. And then more recently in our partnership, uh, we developed a, a 10 year plan for the Ridge Rivers partnership in 2016, and then of course, Ada County's own comprehensive plan from 2016. Some of that language you might find in those documents to support what we do. Just county may expend funds to maintain and improve these properties. Um, full carrying cost of the land is a resp full responsibility of the county. Um, the recommendations in these plans include to acquire land for future parks, open space, recreation facilities and trails maintain those, expand or renovate those locations and facilities, 
and develop new ones. And then also some language regarding staffing and those plans to identify and achieve the level of staffing to do all these things. And, and just briefly point out that the, the comp plan did, um, because there was so much community involvement and interest in open space and trails, uh, there is a whole separate exhibit um, and addendum uh, in that uh, exhibit B or addendum B, I guess is what it's referred to, but it is all about uh, open space and the toolkit for open space and trails. The citizens really believe in what we do for the county. So we often get asked, you know, do you have an army of staff to do all that? Um, we don't. We have eight people. That's us. So all of those things are overseen, implemented, done, hands on the ground, whether you're, you know, everything from cleaning a restroom, refilling toilet paper, mowing the lawn, trimming trees on the green belt, shoveling snow. This is all eight of us making sure people enjoy the event center. Average years of employment, four and a half years. Longest tenured, seven years. Shortest, 18 months. Madam Chair, um, I noticed you don't have a ton of people with you, and I'm guessing because they're real busy. They have a lot to do. <laughs> that is correct, Commissioner. Too busy to be here. Okay. They're supporting me in the back there, I'm sure. Uh, I feel like I've covered the first three bullet items, the last two. Um, from our budget prep guidelines were supplemental requests and CIP requests. Um, first off, just the same information you were provided um, with by Kathleen. This was our department submitted budget for parks and waterways. Supplemental requests would total $470,499 with $293,499 of that ongoing. As mentioned, PBS supplemental was a small amount. That was a maintenance mechanic HR recommendation. Supplemental request number one would be phase two for the Red Hawk um, connection to Avamore. So something that's, that's been talked about for about two decades now is connecting the Ridge Rivers trail system to Avamore and in that trail system area. Um, and, and getting up towards Stack Rock is really what a lot of people are interested in from that location. Phase two would integrate Ada County's Red Hawk property to connect it to Havamore. I would request $55,000 to do that through the general fund. Supplemental request number two, uh, as identified as the major equipment, um, items that we use through in and without uh, the Barber Park property as well as other facilities, wood chipper primarily for the 12 miles of Greenbelt. $42,000 request from the general fund. Number three, $250,000 requested from the general fund. Now you'll see the CIP requests for Greenbelt replacement, whether or not those are supported um, through CIP. We still have 12 plus miles of Greenbelt we're responsible to maintain. That includes shoulder maintenance, erosion, patch and repair of root intrusion if it is not a brand new facility. Um, this amounts to about $20,000 miles or $20,000 per mile of Greenbelt. Um, which is consistent with what it would take to, to manage our Greenbelt green belt facilities. What we currently have is Ada County owns somewhat of a road system. Think of it as an alternative transportation system with recreation. We don't have an improvement fund for that on a regular basis. That's really what this is intended to establish. Again, whether or not CIP is granted, perhaps we could you know, use portions of this for those CIP locations, but we have other needs. Um, far and beyond those CIP needs on Greenbelt property. Scott, how long has this um, ongoing um, repair cost been in your budget? Madam Chair, to clarify, this is the first time we're asking for it, and that is the request. Because it has not been in the budget in the past, we've had a small division for Greenbelt. Mm -hmm. We've never had a sufficient amount to do what's needed to be done for Greenbelt management. So we can anticipate that you're going to want to put this in from here forward. That so is cr that is the request. Madam like operations Chair. does, um, in a sense, they have a certain amount for ongoing operations that they just roll over every year. Correct. Okay. And in fact, since you mentioned operations, you know we do collaborate quite a bit on our greenbelt replacement projects. This figure was was created in consultation with with operations as well. Um, we we gathered some feedback. Appreciate that, Madam Chair. Um, 
I wonder if there's an opportunity, and this is, is probably a, a sidebar conversation, but to utilize some of the resources that operations is bringing on board um, with the facility dude uh, uh, software system to be able to monitor and track um, where repairs are needed, what's coming up, what's the next phase we be, need to be paying attention to, just an idea to think through for collaboration. Madam Chair, Commissioner Lachiando, I'll talk with them about that and see if there's an opportunity there. Thank you. I will round out the supplemental requests here. Supplemental four is for that Oregon Trailhead facility. We did win an award, although we don't have a restroom at the site. We'd love to have a restroom at that site. Simple vault toilet facility and some entry signage. We're requesting $50,000 from the general fund. The grant from ITD has since been closed out. That was more for property acquisition. I think it's a good time for the county to inject some capital up there. Supplemental request number five is a mini skid steer, which is primarily for those open space and trail properties. We don't have um, equipment other than hand tools currently that we utilize for management of those trails. We contracted that trail build, trail maintenance, and creation of new trail. We can do some of that in-house. Mini skid steer would get us a long way. We would use this across the county, primarily for the off-site from Barber Park facilities. Madam Chair, Scott, um, what, if any, uh tool resource sharing do we have across Register Rivers when, it rega when it's regarding maintenance? Madam Chair, Commissioner Lachiando, we do, um, the way our Register Rivers partnership works traditionally is, yeah, we do collaborate and share sometimes staff and personnel, sometimes equipment, but typically Register Rivers is experiencing the same type of demand for service on the resources. So the equipment and personnel they have to deploy over 200 miles of trail is a tremendous challenge. So we can't, you know, to maintain county property, we need county equipment is probably the best way to, to look at it. Um, we don't we don't often beg, borrow, and steal any longer. It just isn't feasible to do so. Okay. Uh, and lastly, um, again, there's about a 30, 30 different lines that I see an increase in operational expenses through, through multiple park divisions. Some examples would include increase in fuel insurance, uniforms, security systems, bank card and service charges, those types of items, um, to name a few. That's in the amount of $40,672, a request from the general fund. So that, that is your $470,499 in supplementals. CIP requests overview. We have a $931,000 in request from the general fund and then a $645,000 request from our fund balance for a total of 1.576 million. I will clarify. You heard on the first day Mitra had suggested, you know, some of where our project submittals ranked out in the transformation board. And this particular project um, was brought to your attention. We originally did request $890,000 from the general fund for Barber Park um, enhancements which would be split accordingly, half and half. <clears throat> we intended to use half our fund balance requests, half from the general fund. When we were told that was unlikely to occur or that the general fund may not be supportive of that, we determined that we could dig into our fund balance for a portion of phases one and two of that, totaling $645,000. Because operationally, we'd be asking for trouble if we didn't do some work in Barber Park before the whole next fiscal year flipped around with two new float seasons. So the result is we're not requesting any money from the CIP for that. Expo Idaho Greenbelt Pathways number two, and this is an overview. We're requesting $706,000 for phase one and phase two would be 531,000. Phase one you can look at as design engineering, surveying those types of components. Phase two would be construction. Priority three was the green belt repair for Sunrock. And again, Mitra had suggested that um, this was recommended for tabling from the transformation board. That last bullet item indicates that um, we do have an opportunity with some FEMA funds that we have access to. We will do what we can to patch things up with some of those FEMA funds. Um, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, have been having some conversations, as you know, Scott, uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers in Garden City about um, what the flood maps are gonna look like going forward. And so I think before we get to the uh, deliberation phase, 
I would like to see um, some additional options for Expo Idaho. I, I know we need to do something there, but I'm a little worried about putting money in, um, not knowing what the future holds in terms of what the Army Corps is gonna be asking of us. So um, if you could get us some additional options, that would be helpful. Madam Chair, Commissioner, I will do so. And I hope you understand it's just simply my responsibility to bring those to your attention, particularly without a current director for Expo, just to make sure that you're aware of the condition. Absolutely. We are Prior aware. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you're, you're going to hear about it again in a few slides here, so sorry about that. This is a phase, uh, I'm sorry, Barber Park, the CIP submittal for Barber Park. This is just an overview. The Transformation Board received a lot more material, but this identifies the issue here, and we have a parking issue. We overflow every, we close the front of the park every weekend now um, because we're full. Uh, we have 177 designated parking stalls on asphalt, and the rest we put in the overflow parking field. Um, we park sometimes about 1,200 cars a day. Um, we run out of room real quick. And then there's also portions of the, the trail system in the park that are really uh, hazardous. They were former entry and parking lot and you know just it's dilapidated asphalt that was left behind from the 70s when the park was developed and left there as a trail, but it's not really a trail. So we need to replace those walkways for the public with concrete. Uh, the expo, you mentioned you know enough about it. There's the expo green belt that we're referring to. Um, that's some examples of the condition that it's in. My boot is four inches in width. Um, that's a pretty big hole. Yep. And you also have some confinement, and it's no longer a standard pathway width. It's about nine feet. Standard tip width that we use is 11 feet based on um, all uh, nationwide standardization for multi-use pathways, multi-directional, and volume of traffic is 11 feet. You have some confinement with the fence. Um, additionally from the old Expo Racing, or the uh, Treasure Valley Racing. Um, last example of that, you did receive this testimonial. This is one of the, and I only bring this to your attention, you received this earlier this week or last week. Um, this is one of many I've received in the five years that I've been the county's park director. Um, this is, this occurs all the time. The reason it, we really haven't done anything is because it's not a facility that I traditionally manage but the county needs to be aware that on this piece of property that the county owns, you have a condition of an asset that's been failing for quite some time. Um, whether general fund is appropriate, whether expo funding is appropriate, I don't know. I don't believe parks and waterways funding is appropriate to fix this. That's why I bring this to you as a CIP submittal. Um, before we completed the Mesa and the Penn Canal, those two were our two highest priorities countywide. Now that we've completed them, Expo Idaho is the number one priority in the county for repair. Uh, so Scott, who was managing this? You, you said you have not been managing it. So Madam Chair, it, it is an Expo Idaho piece of property. Um, we won't inject any capital into it, but because we've done some other enhancements for just management of a pathway in the vicinity, which is the Sunrock pathway, we started to incorporate it into our route and communicated that to the former director that, hey, we'll at least blow leaves and sweep the pathway, keep it clear of snow when it snows. And so we were doing a lot of that um, because the public demanded it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, I was just replacing to asset, yeah, where yeah. it belonged in terms of jurisdiction, is it under Expo or is Ada it County? Under it's an Ada County. That's yeah. probably the best way to put it. Not Expo, okay, we need to get not Parks, but it's Ada County and it's on the property. Madam Chair, maybe I have a question on that, and Scott, just to flesh that thought out a little bit. I recognize there's needed funding to be able to repair it, so that <clears throat> preface it with that and the looming questions that Commissioner Laciano, but in terms of the ongoing future, do you think if there was new funding to help maintain that, that it would be appropriate under parks at that point because it's an extension of it? Because the long-term future, regardless of what that may look like for the fairgrounds and everything, presumably the green belt will always be some element in that phase mm -hmm. and it i guess from my point of view it does seem like parks would be an appropriate space you just need funding to be able to manage that which is I, wh what i think i'm hearing from you ultimately madam chair phil yes that is okay. probably the easiest way to put it you did it a lot better than i did in a lot fewer words so. okay i just want to yeah. make sure we're yep. thinking similarly you are 
Um, so that's kind of the one of the more negative kind of comments you'll receive on that. Um, Sunrock Greenbelt, again, this was tabled, but again, this is, uh, again, falls under 80 County, falls under 80 County Parks and Waterways to maintain. Um, this one is somewhat embarrassing at the moment as well. Um, from the Garden City limits to the West Boise Wastewater Treatment Facility, the county uh, took on five easement agreements to manage this segment of Greenbelt. In the summer of 2016 and in the spring of 2017, it flooded and created a lot of damage. This is the current condition of the pathway. Where the flood fight occurred, saw cuts, heavy equipment, everything was used to prevent pit capture, the Sunrock gravel pit. This is what you would find out there today from 2017 damage. Scott, did you said there's an opportunity for potential grant money or possibly even help from Sunrock in repairing this section? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll point out that in February, shortly after you all took, um, took office, you did sign an agreement that finally shook loose the FEMA money. Um, that FEMA money had a closed date of April 6th. We requested an extension. We were granted the extension. So now we do have some available funding to do some patchwork and repair um, on this site, which we will intend to do so if we don't get major capital anyway, so. Thank you. Yep. I'll finish on a positive note. You've received two CIP letters of support, one from the Foundation for Ada Canyon Trail Systems and the second from the Ada County Parks Open Space and Trails Advisory Board. Um, an excerpt from that fax letter from the President, William Gigray, says the funding allocated through CIP has allowed Parks and Waterways to successfully complete critical and long overdue projects benefiting the entire community, such as the Warm Springs Mesa and Penitentiary Canal Greenbelt Pathways. This year, these projects include the Expo Idaho and Sunrock Greenbelt Pathway segments, each of which are in need of significant repair or complete reconstruction. Pathway system is in place. In place is one of our most valuable recreation, recreational and pedestrian transportation systems in our valley and a major attraction in Ada County, which promotes health and the economy. We urge you to support of this CIP funding request. And the letter from your chair of your Open Space and Trails Advisory Board um, says, it's been encouraging to see Ada County embrace CIP to prioritize funding for larger projects countywide. In preparation for this fiscal year 20 CIP, Director Coburg provided an overview of the three proposals and associated budgets for consideration on behalf of Parks and Waterways. Uh, the board enthusiastically supports each of the fiscal year 20 CIP submittals from Parks and Waterways and we respectfully recommend you do the same by providing funding as requested to implement these important projects. Carrie Koska, who's the chair. I realize I'm over time. I'll try to go quickly through Expo, but with that, I'll stand for any additional questions. Okay, any questions? I, I just want to say thank you and your team, your lean team. Yeah. Um, and just the, the recreational opportunities and the environmental stewardship that, that you all provide really does translate into economic vitality. So it's not just about having fun on the green belt. Um, it brings people here and they work and play and stay here and it really creates the community um, that is inviting for people to come and live here. So I see the bigger picture here and the priorities of having um, our trails, open spaces and waterways continue to improve. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Expo, Kathleen. Yes. Right. Scott is the former Expo Idaho interim director and will be, rep be representing Expo Idaho, which is broken into two departments, fair and interim events. The fair provides the annual Western Idaho Fair the third week in August each year and promotes the present and future of agriculture in Ada County with annual attendance of 250,000. The facility is located on the northwest corner of Shinden and Glenwood. The 240 acre footprint encompasses 15 buildings which equals approximately 300,000 square feet. The fair has parking for approximately 4,500 vehicles and a grandstand with a seating capacity of 4,000, along with the 225 slips for an RV park. Interim events or events or activities on shows that occur the rest of the year when the Western Idaho Fair is not in progress. The interim events equal about 150 events and approximately 435 event days per year. 
which include the Sportsman Show, Roadster Show, Dog and Cat Shows, Flea Markets, Health Fairs, Ski Swaps, Weddings, and the Boise Music Fest. In front of you is the Expo Idaho budget. They are one of your enterprise funds, totally self-supported. Budget for FY20 submitted at 7,970,090, an increase of $1,010,760. Operating budget, 6,770,564. Operating bu or personnel budget, 1,199,526. Below you can see the changes. Most of them are related. Uh, the biggest increase is related to the roof repairs. And I'd like to go ahead and turn it back over to Scott to give you more information on this budget. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, good to see you, commissioners. Thank you for the time to present the budget. I have three minutes to get us back on schedule. I'll do my best. Uh, as tempting as it was when I was acting as interim director for Expo Idaho to carve off a huge chunk of Expo funding for Greenbelt repair, I chose not to do so. <laughs> I felt the roof repair was probably a priority for that revenue. Uh, and I will just provide a brief overview and then stand for questions, uh, which I may or may not be able to answer. Um, primarily for the folks in this room and also for the board, uh, Expo Idaho overview, there's 240 acres of 80 county property out there. Uh, the majority of that property is used to host the 10 day Western Idaho Fair. However, several areas of the property do generate revenue year round. And there are other areas of the property that really don't generate a lot of revenue, but they're under various long-term or renewable agreements for occupancy and or facility development. Those would include the Greenbelt Pathway, the U of I Extension Building, Paramedics, Boise Fire, Boise Hawks, North Boise Little League, which utilizes, <clears throat> regularly utilizes Lady Bird Park, and then Treasure Valley Racing, which was formerly a significant revenue source, but now is unoccupied and that lease is no longer in existence. So if you look at that Expo Idaho property, which I think some of you are very familiar with, um, kind of a different perspective here facing west, but uh, you'll see the, the property here. And really all of it is integrated in some way or fashion during the fair. The grandstand from the former horse racing track is used for concerts during the fair. All the parking is utilized. But the beating heart of the Expo property year round is really kind of identified in this outline. Um, this area in red all brings revenue in various forms and functions um, to Expo throughout the course of the year. So what are interim events? It's really what happens in the interim events budget is what happens the other 355 days each year when the Western Idaho Fair is not taking place. So multiple buildings, facilities, grounds, equipment are available for event rental. That would include the exposition building, which is where you get the expo in Expo Idaho. The premium building, Western Town, Barnes and Gazebos, or Barnes and Arenas, sorry, the parks, gazebos, blacktop parking lots, everything is sort of for rent um, to bring in money. With that, you do receive about 750,000 visitors for all those types of events that Kathleen pointed out. And just about anything and everything happens out at Expo. I learned that during my time as interim. This is kind of an overview of the property when you wouldn't see it uh, allocated for fair operations. Gives you an idea and understanding of all the facilities sort of available um, to be utilized by the public for rent. And the top would be an example of the uh, Expo Idaho. You've got the, the north, central, and, and uh, south facility of Expo building. Um, you got the livestock barn in the center and then the premium building on the bottom all available to generate revenue for the county outside of the fair. So just an example of that budgeted revenue from everything um, for this submitted budget. Buildings and facilities is about 774,000. Food and beverage sales, Expo Idaho actually uh, has a liquor license and generates a lot of uh, revenue from food and beverage sales for events, including the Boise Music Festival coming up in a couple weeks, um, which is a tremendous uh, injection of revenue for the interim. Utilities and fees, about 79,000. And then the Boise Riverside RV Park generates about $540,000 in revenue for the county. Various other is about 144, 145,000 almost. So roughly three, uh, $2 million annually for each of the past three years. 
Uh, I mention this because it is an enterprise fund, so what money they make, they put back in. Moving from interim to the fair, that's a better example of how that property is occupied during the Western Idaho Fair. And kind of an overview of that briefly. Um, that's why it's referred to as the fairgrounds is because Expo Idaho has hosted the fair since 1967. You, you <coughs> all familiar concerts, carnivals, competitions, concessions, agriculture, entertainment, and then that receives about 250,000 visitors over that 10 days in August. That's more of a graphic of what that would look like. And this is actually the map for the upcoming fair uh, in August, from August 16 to 25. All the fun stuff you can do and see at the fair. Budgeted revenue for the fair includes $1.553 million in admissions, nearly a million in food and beverage sales, $860,000 in carnival, miscellaneous accounts for about $293,906. Sponsorship and various other brings in about $423,000. And so for the second straight year, Western Idaho Fair had a, also a tremendous year last year, broke all their records. Um, this is the second year where revenue is expected to exceed $4 million. And that's what's budgeted. So the department submitted budget. As pointed out by Kathleen, uh, operating capital accounts for $6,770,564. That does include about a million and a half dollars in roof repairs and some other repairs on site. So the difference in revenue typically in this year's submitted budget is using some of that fund balance or that capital from the, from the enterprise fund to put back in the facility primarily for roof repairs. That's the lion's share of it. So Scott, we have in this uh, current budget for this year, roof repairs budgeted at 1,100,550. Um, is that the mid-size animal barn roof? There are two roof repairs in that, if you'll see. There's the, the 1,015,000, one of them is the expo building, the other one is the, um, there's a couple of other roof locations, but that's, I think there's a 400 and something thousand dollar one in the supplemental down further. Yeah, what's the, My what's understanding the was the, the roof repair for expo was 1.9 million. I think, figure Maybe. I heard was 1.5, but I could uh, I could look into that. Well, yeah, I'm really interested mm -hmm. in getting, um, and we can talk afterwards, but sure. getting more detailed analysis of the deferred maintenance and upcoming immediate needs okay. for maintenance. Great. Thank you. Thank you again for your interim directorship out there. Sure thing, and I'm really close to wrapping up and I'll be completely done with that interim. Uh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Keep the glee out of your voice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All told, when you incorporate the personnel budget, as mentioned, again, nearly $8 million as the department's budget. With that, just for fun, I'll take questions and give you the, uh, op the acts for the Western Idaho Fair and the dates that they'll be performing. <laughs> any questions? I don't have any questions at this time. I would love um, copies of your PowerPoint that um, have the statistics and numbers. I don't need the nitty gritty dirt band unless Diana wants to put that on her <laughs> wall in her office picture. <laughs> I can leave it on this this laptop if that's okay. <laughs> they're they're pretty large. Yeah. No, we're good. Thank you for the time. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Scott. Really appreciate it. I almost got us back on schedule too. Yeah, great. All right. Can we just take a break after this? Yeah. One more. One more. One more. Good to listen we, to Adam. We good? Yeah. Okay. Adam Schroeder is the director of Weed Control, Pest Extermination, and Mosquito Abatement. Weed Control enforces the Idaho Noxious Weed Law and works to control or eradicate noxious weeds found within Ada County. Currently, 35 out of the 67 state designated noxious weed species are within the county. Pest extermination provides pest control services to landowners living within the pest abatement district. Pest abatement crews manage, or manage gopher and rock chuck infestations that threaten agriculture or infrastructure on public and private partner, property. Mosquito abatement provides mosquito surveillance, monitoring, and control, and control services to taxpayers living within the mosquito abatement district. Mosquito abatement works within an integrated pest management plan 
to mitigate the impact of West Nile virus and other vector-borne diseases within Ada County. First up, we have WEED. They are a um, special levy fund within the 3% cap. Budget submitted for FY20, 1,142,286, an increase of 54,603. Operating budget, 641,593. Personnel budget, 680,693. This budget does include supplemental requests of 46,490. Below, you can see the changes. One supplemental on the operating side uh, for that 46,000 is for a mobile data collection project. Moving on to PEST, they are one of your special taxing districts. They have their own 3% that they do not share with anyone. FY20 budget submitted at 717,102, an increase of $3,966. Operating budget 484,300, personnel budget 232, 802. This budget includes a supplemental request of 12,176. Below, you'll see that's broken into a supplemental request in personnel for PBS for um, one special salary adjustment and one supplemental on the operating side entitled GIS Database Phase 2, a recommendation from IT. And finally, we have Mosquito, one of your other special taxing districts. Budget for FY20 submitted at 1,220,500. 41, an increase of 15,143. Operating budget 792, 634. Personnel budget 427, 907. No supplemental requests uh, within this budget. The changes are below. And at this point, I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Adam Schroeder to give you some more information. Thank you, Kathleen. Welcome, Adam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, uh, Adam, before we get started, I, I can't believe I haven't asked this question before, but, but can someone give me some history on why weed is a special levy within the 3% cap, but um, mosquito and pest are um, outside of that? I will talk about that, um, Madam Chair, Commissioner Luciando. Okay. I will talk about that in the presentation. Okay. Great, thank you. Yes. May I approach? Of course. Thank you. I'll make sure that Commissioner Visser gets one. Thank you. Well, I think I already clicked one ahead, so <laughs> apologize for that. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the board, Madam Chair, Commissioner Lachiando, esteemed Clerk McGrain. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to present the Weed Pest and Mosquito Abatement FY 2020 budget. It is my honor to serve the great people of Ada County in my capacity as director. I'm humbled by your continued support and guidance. On behalf of the uh, WPM employees, Weed Pest Mosquito employees, we'd also like to thank you uh, for your consideration of the 3% COLA merit uh, for FY um, 2020. I would like to thank Clerk McGrain, uh, Madam Controller Graves, Mrs. Lori Beck, Mr. Tim Sturgis, Ms. Cassie Porter, uh, Ms. Kelly Ponenin, Mr. Bob Perkins, and all the fine folks in Human Resources and Administrative Services for their continued support during our budget process. We would also like to thank Director O'Mara, Mr. Todd Buchanan, and all the excellent staff at Ada County ITGIS, as well as Madam Prosecutor Bennett, uh, Mrs. Heather McCarthy, and her staff at the Prosecutor's Office for helping us consistently strive to improve our service levels and achieve our departmental goals. So thank you. Presentation overview uh, on the agenda for, day, for today, if it pleases the board, I would like to begin by introducing the audience to our agency and by stating who we are and what we do, um, and then give a brief background on each of our three departments, and then follow up with budget requests for each sequentially. After the agency overview, I, I will begin with weed control, followed by the pest abatement district, and conclude with mosquito abatement district. So who are we and what do we do? Well, um, Ada County Weed Pest and Mosquito Abatement is an agency that houses three distinct departments, Noxious Weed Control, the Pest Abatement District, and the Mosquito Abatement District. The three departments have come together to share a facility, equipment, and administrative staff. Our office is located on the West Ada campus on the southwest corner of Locust Grove and uh, Pine and Meridian, and we also have a uh, silver or uh, certified lead uh, building on the silver certification. So. 
The shared administrative staff includes a facility and inventory specialist, a program and education specialist, an accounts clerk, an administrative assistant, an administrative specialist, a deputy director, and my position as director. All of these positions are partially funded by all three departments. Weed Control has a division coordinator, a compliant, uh, two compliance leads, a field technician two, five field technician ones, and we also hire part-time seasonal help during the spring and early summer. The Pest Abatement District has one full-time division coordinator and up to 15 part-time seasonals, and they work from February through November. The Mosquito Abatement District has uh, a division coordinator, two crew leads, uh, one for larvicide operations and one for adulticide, two field technicians, and up to 15 part-time seasonals. In total, we have 21 full-time employees and up to 30 part-time seasonals working during the season. Uh, I have to tell you, it is my distinct pleasure to work with these fine folks. They're the best in the business. Um, often, the services that we provide and the people out in, our, uh, out in the field are targets for criticism. Um, I'd like you to know that our folks care a lot about the environment and the people that live here in Ada County, and that's why we do this, and they're the best uh, and really fun to be around. So I wonder Madam if Chair, you... Adam, I'd just like to share with you, I happened to be in a meeting with uh, Mayor Ridgeway of Eagle yesterday, and he was uh, singing your praises. He had had uh, some of your, I believe, larvicide crew out just the day prior and helped identify um, larvae. Um, in some <laughs> lots of larvae uh, in his his area, so um, he was very thankful and very appreciative. I just wanted to pass that along, Madam Chair, Commissioner Lasciano. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, they are out there working hard right now, and of course, it's the heat of the season. So, uh, as you can see, Madam Chair, our agency's mission, vision, philosophy, and values are exactly aligned with Ada County's. Uh, principles. Uh, they are exactly what we strive to do and be every day. So our mission is to provide effective and efficient services and programs that enhance our community's quality of life. Our vision is to be a premier governmental entity demonstrating fiscal responsibility and professional excellence and to be recognized for providing innovative and proactive solutions for our communities through open and accessible government. Our philosophy is built on a foundation of our values humanity, excellence, integrity, and trust and stewardship, and we serve as leaders in our community. Our values are humanity, excellence, integrity, trust, and stewardship. Here are a few photos of our facility and equipment. On the upper left, you can see one of our dual bay, or one side of our dual bay rinsate facility, which captures all of the dirty water from pesticide and pesticide residues from wash trucks and tanks and stores them in large holding tank. Uh, this facility is not connected to a municipal water drain, so water comes in, but it doesn't go out. Um, we collect that water and then we spray the water on the roadsides through a cooperative agreement with ACHD. Um, on the upper right, you can see that we keep most of our vehicles under cover to protect them from weathering. On the bottom left, you will see our mosquito lab that was completed as part of the addition to the primary facility in 2016 and 17. This is where our staff counts and identifies mosquitoes and also where we conduct preliminary West Nile virus screenings. On the bottom right, you can see the control system from one of our herbicide application trucks. Our applications are recorded via GIS programming and are rate controlled. That means that the system adjusts the rate of the application by restricting or opening flow in the direct correlation with real-time speed of the vehicle, and all the applications are drawn on GIS layers for reporting purposes. We are also responsible for the West Ada Fuel Station. We buy the fuel, maintain the hardware and software, facilitate the inspections and permitting requirements, stock the fluids and towels, and provide key to access fuel services to several Ada County agencies, including EMS, Sheriff's Office, Emergency Communi Communications, Operations, Juvenile Court, ITGIS, and of course all of our internal departments. We run the station as a service to the county and other municipalities. It is not a substantial funding source for us. The revenue that we gather from the station goes towards its maintenance and administrative costs. The revenues and expenses for the fuel station are included in the weed control budget. Madam Chair, Adam, do we have other municipalities um, or entities utilizing this as well? We have in the past, um, Madam Chair, Madam uh, Commissioner Laciano, we have in the past, Meridian Police 
has used the facility and we do offer that to other municipalities, we don't currently have uh, many that are using or taking So it's not advantage. a significant savings in any way for them to be able to utilize it? In fact, I think it would be, mm -hmm. but it is their choice whether or not they okay. choose to do that. In the state of Idaho, all counties are required to maintain a noxious weed control department and a noxious weed control superintendent who is responsible for local enforcement of Title 22, Chapter 24, the Idaho Noxious Weed Law, that's me. Um, Ada County's Noxious Weed Control Department is funded by special levy and supplemented with enterprise funds collected by providing weed control services to agencies and landowners and uh, any folks who have difficulty controlling noxious weeds by their own means. Uh, in 2018, uh, the special levy enterprise split was about 80-20. 80-20, 80% 80 being special levy. There are currently 32 out of 67 Idaho listed noxious weeds in Ada County. I know um, Kathleen said 35, but we're uh, making progress. Um, with about 26 <laughs> that are actively managed. Um, the Do others you have, have a board you can put up with just, you know, Cross them out, no longer wanted, or? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. Commissioner Lanciano, it's much more of a celebration than that. Yeah, we, okay. yeah. All right. we'd put it so on the outside it. of the building. It's the opposite of a ribbon cutting, okay. You got it, yes, thank you. Um, so we have 26 that are actively managed. Uh, the others have been detected and eradicated, but we continue to monitor the sites just in case of reoccurrence, because that happens. Um, Ada County Weed Control provides several services to the county landowners and public agencies, including enforcements and compliance activities, public land treatments, survey and research projects, enterprise weed control services, nuisance weed control complaints in cooperation with PA's office, and noxious weed free forage and straw inspections and certifications. Adam, I know noxious weeds can be a real problem, like cheatgrass is a tremendous problem in this area. Do we partner with the state of Idaho, with BLM or Forest Service, anyone in, in trying to, you know, when there's like fight a fire or something to get rid of that and replant with something that is a little healthier and that chokes out the cheatgrass, for example? Um, Just smiling. Madam Chair, yes, it's an excellent <laughs> question. And um, yes, we do partner with BLM uh, to survey and treat noxious weeds on federal ground. Um, however, cheatgrass is not considered a noxious weed. It is an invasive mm. grass, so it is not on our list. Oh, so um, interesting. We Who are determines really... that? Is that the state, the feds, science? That... So, yeah. well, <laughs> right. can, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, uh, people petition the state of Idaho to have a uh, a weed listed on the noxious oh, okay. weed list, and that li weed list is included in state rule. So, the Department okay. of Agriculture. Um, administrates the rule which has the listings. Interesting. Now, um, to put cheatgrass on the list would um, be a monumental task because, of course, there's so much of it, I'm not sure that the counties could bear that additional cost in, in enforcement. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, please forgive the sports talk, but for weed control, 2018-2019 has been a rebuild year, administratively speaking. Um, when I assumed the director position in 2017, I learned that a number of business practices and components were out of date or just simply non-existent. So as part of our ongoing improvements, we completed a departmental audit of business structure, personnel, and work directives. Uh, we learned a few things about what was holding us back. Um, we're currently in the process of implementing a reorganization of field staff, accountability practices, internal reassignments, and formalizing our reporting. We've updated and standardized our field technician training program, and we've re revised and published the Ada County Weed Control Action Plan. Um, that's a yearly plan that we do, so we modify that every year. And then, of course, we're currently editing and working on our five-year strate strategic plan. Love to have a copy of that plan when you have it drafted. Uh, yes, ma'am, and you will see it before it ever gets published. You, yeah. you guys have to approve it. So, <laughs> um, oh, let's see. So here we are. Yep, Madam Chair, the following statistics are from 2018 because the budget process happens right in the heart of our weed control season. Because last year was somewhat typical in terms of productivity, I wanted the board to see what a year's worth of 
work looks like rather than have an incomplete picture of FY19. So in 18, we took nearly 1,400 weed control calls and created a little over 1,000 work orders. We treated 2,239 acres of land where noxious weeds were present. We surveyed over 2,000 acres of public land, primarily BLM, and we treated over 280 acres of public land in Ada County. We also released five biocontrol agents throughout the county. Now, these are insect agents that have been approved for release by the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant and Health Inspection Services, uh, and its Plant Port Protection and Quarantine Program. Uh, these biocontrol agents will feed on noxious weeds through various means in hopes that they will reduce the infestations and reproductive capabilities of the weeds over time. Uh, we will continue to monitor and map these infestations and check to see that, that the biocontrol survive. Um, despite what your shoes or bike tires might show you, uh, we do a lot of work uh, on puncture vine. Um, it's about half of the work we do. So for every work order that we take, we have a target pest. And that puncture vine is about half of those. Madam Chair, Adam, um, so are you, have you in the past, or are you looking at partnering up with the Boise Bike Project and the Goathead Fest that they're doing? Madam Chair, Commissioner Laciando, yes, we're actually partnering with them this year. Okay. We've been a part of their planning meetings. Uh, we, I just had my program and education specialist attend their uh, meeting yesterday as far as getting some flyers out. So um, we're hoping to help uh, wherever we can, wherever it's, we can legally do that um, as far as the partnership goes. And, and uh, yeah, absolutely, we'll have our education trailer out there. We'll be trying to educate folks on noxious weeds prevention and, Great. of course, puncture vine control. Great. And if you can share kind of what some of the um, offline, again, what some of the PR and planning strategy is around that, I'd love to be able to help support recruiting volunteers, et cetera. Thank you. And yes, we have Boise Kind Day coming up, um, which I will be at um, for puncture vine pooling. And uh, I know my family will be there, whether they like it or not. <laughs> and uh, um, so we'll be out there pulling puncture vine with the Boise City volunteers, and hopefully we can gain some recruits from our folks too. Great. Um, so in 2018, our enterprise services made about $180,000, which is within the standard range of income for the five to 10 year period. Um, this year we are somewhat behind in revenues because we've had an extremely high turnover rate at the field technician spot due to increasing wages and general labor positions and in the private sector and beyond. We have experienced delays in what amounts to 30 days of lost productivity due to rain or wind events this spring. Kind of brings us into our challenges. Um, Madam Chair, we face a number of challenges related to the new direction that we are taking the department, namely implementing new processes and shifting the culture. We are working to install a highly coordinated and communicative work environment where assignments are clear, solutions are collaborative, and we all hold each other accountable and help each other succeed. And like many of our fellow departments, retaining our experienced employees continues to be a challenge. However, we have had some tremendous luck with our recent hires, and we are really excited to see them reach their potential. Um, one of our primary objectives is to update the noxious weed inventory throughout the county. Once we have a greater understanding of the weed infestations we face, we will be able to make more informed land management plans with our fellow agencies and public landowners. Uh, weather delays and other setbacks will continue to provide challenges for our product productivity and levels of service. Uh, like the photo you see, it's not a matter of if we get stuck, it's a matter of when. <laughs> and having an actionable plan to get back on the road safely and efficiently is our focus. The Ada County Weed Control Appropriation is $1,103,946 with uh, $688,843 of that funding our personnel and $461,000 $593 in operating expense. Uh, we're requesting an operating supplemental in the amount of $46,490 to be funded from our fund balance in order to purchase a new hardware and software package that will help Ada County ITGIS with the development of our new accounting database and collection of mobile data. This is the project that Mitra mentioned um, that we had withdrawn from the CIP because we found a, a more effective and uh, cheaper way to do this. So, um, Madam Chair, the fund balance for weed control is $660,236. 
And if it pleases the board, I will move on to the pest abatement district. Please. The Ada County Pest Abatement District provides gopher and rock chuck abatement services to folks who reside within the abatement district boundaries. And the department is entirely funded by the taxes assessed to those properties within the district. The abatement district boundaries are mostly defined as unincorporated Ada County. The pest abatement district is, is approximately 894 square miles of land within Ada County. Adam, do we limit our definition of pests to gophers and rock chucks? And occasional yellow bellied marmots? <laughs> Madam Just Chair, check. yes, yellow bellied marmots are rock chucks, they're the same thing. Um, and yes, those are the only two uh, species listed on the abatement statutes, yes. Okay. Madam Chair, um, Adam, just if you don't mind, if you can, succinctly explain to me what was the thinking in terms of when this statute put was put into place, limiting it to unincorporated, who's supposed to be handling it within incorporate? Is that animal control? Like, I'm just sort of confused in the history of how this came about. Madam Chair, Commissioner Laciando, I'm not exactly uh, clear on the history of mm -hmm of the creation of the Pest Abatement District. It happened a long time ago. Um, but essentially why we work in un unincorporated Aid County is just that there are pest control services that will take care of uh, commercial pest control services okay. that will do those services within the cities. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of folks outside of incorporated Aid County that need a lot of help. And so that's why uh, essentially that's where work is. Our pest abatement folks have been very busy in 2018 and FY 2019, we completed 2,500 work orders and treated over 9,600 acres within the district. That's almost a 25% increase in acres treated over 2017. Uh, spring, infest, spring pest infestation levels have caused considerable delay in response time in addition to weather delays. And in order to increase our service levels, we added an additional three person field crew in FY 2019, and we were able to reduce our response time by over 40%. We take pride in training our field staff and the training program update I spoke about in weed control is standardized throughout the three departments. Our pest abatement folks completed over 500 hours of training, including the attendance in, of recertification seminars. We also experienced a reduction in new clients. That, those are calls to the office from folks who haven't had service before. Um, we like to believe we can attribute it to doing a better job controlling pests and reducing the spread of gophers onto new properties, but it could also be urbanization. The district is not facing insurmountable challenges for the years to come, and in many ways, if we can keep good people on the temp staff payroll, uh, keep them trained uh, and purchase the equipment and vehicles they need. We can continue to make progress controlling pests. I know that labor's gonna cost us a little more as we go. Um, that's expected and I think the abatement district can handle that. Um, we get a lot of calls to control voles and other pests in residential and semi-agricultural settings. Uh, we need to do a better job of educating folks about our directive and what the abatement rules, uh, district rules allow us to do. Um, there are many commercial pests control companies that we spoke about who offer these services and we don't want to compete with those folks. So. The FY 2020 Pest Abatement District appropriation is $707,331 with $235,198 in personnel expenses and $484,300 in operating expenses. We have a supplemental request for a a small special salary adjustment that has been recommended by HR. We also have an operating supplemental for $10,000 to pay for ITGIS development of our new database that we are requesting to be extracted from fund balance. Um, that should be the final year for um, any funds to come from pest abatement to that project. ITGIS is writing a project for all three departments. Right now they're working on pest. They're hoping to finish that up and then next work on weed and then go to mosquitoes. So you'll see, you'll continue to see supplemental requests for that as the years go. Uh, if it pleases the board, I'd like to move on to the Mosquito Abatement District. 
The Mosquito Abatement District is a special taxing district. The services uh, we provide are entirely funded by the taxes assessed to the properties within the district. The Mosquito Abatement District is approximately 402 square miles of land within Ada County. It's almost reverse of the Pest Abatement District yeah. where we're working in the cities in the Mosquito Abatement mm -hmm. District. Our Mosquito Abatement District is composed of three integrated programs, uh, surveillance, larvicide, and adulticide. The surveillance program traps and identifies mosquitoes and um, monitors mosquito populations and tests for vector species for presence of disease. The larvicide program discovers, monitors, and treats mosquito breeding sites. And the adulticide program treats adult flying mosquitoes during nighttime hours as a response to public request because of high mosquito uh, populations or because West Nile virus has been detected in the area. Commissioners 2018 was a low volume year for the Mosquito Abatement District, especially when compared with 2017. However, we were able to make some significant improvements to our processes. We trapped uh, around 29,000 mosquitoes and tested 10,000 of them for West Nile virus. We were able to increase the overall productivity and safety of our larvicide crews by pairing technicians and we completed uh, 98,000 inspections last year. We were able to map over 3,000 new larvicide sites for a total of sites that we actively monitor that is just under 40,000. That's- I don't want you to go into detail, but I'm just really curious how pairing technicians saves money in your- um, Madam Chair, pairing uh, technicians allows uh, one person to drive and the other person to work on the tablet and, and work the mosquito, uh, uh, map the sites, do the treatments. As they work in pairs, they can work both sides of the road. They can um, cover more ground and see more sites in a day than one person can in two days. And this is a new practice that you just put into place? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. It also keeps our folks safe while um, instead of looking at their screens and driving. We, yeah. Off the road. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so um, we responded to over 2,000 requests for adulticide treatments and had only nine West Nile positive pool collections. Uh, only two human cases were reported in Ada County. Of course, we'd like to see that number be zero, and we'll continue to work on that. As far as challenges are concerned, we have a few and they are interconnected. Our advisory committee has advocated, advocated for the annexation of the entire county into the Mosquito Abatement District for several reasons, but mostly because we have portions of the county where folks who live uh, would like to re be annexed or receive services. Um, places like Avamore come to mind. Um, as the county continues to develop, we could see more of these subdivisions pop up outside of the district boundaries. Uh, more work needs to be done in terms of feasibility studies on this, but we think the idea is worth the board's attention. Um, Madam Chair, we also anticipate that our, of our three departments, the Mosquito Abatement District will be most affected by population growth in Ada County. With every new development that falls inside the district comes hundreds of new potential mosquito breeding sites that we must find, monitor, and treat. And these are sites that could be overwatered lawns, water features, drain inlets, any number of um, items that could hold water. Uh, increased population will necessitate an increase in area covered and services provided. Madam Chair. Madam. Um, our very first presentation during the course of these budget presentations was um, uh, development services and uh, the idea for creating a regional growth plan. And, and one of the pieces that we're very interested in is getting some really hard numbers about what uh, the various cities' comp plans mean, um, both, both for them but also for us in terms of infrastructure needs. And I think this is one of those um, maybe forgotten uh, often needs in terms of how uh, the way we grow may impact the level of service that you're able to provide. So I guess I would just ask you to work with Meg and Mitra and her team and folding that in. Madam Chair, Commissioner Lachiano, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for the reminder and thank you for bringing that up. Can I just have a question on how uh, the, the abatement district was actually formed, the boundaries? Where did that come from? Um, 
Madam Chair, again, that happened a long time ago. I'm not exactly clear. Um, I probably should be for my, for my own history's sake. Um, but uh, essentially, the abatement district was an independent agency at, when it first was created, and it ran independently for a long time until the commissioners of Ada County decided to bring it in as part of the three weed pest and mosquito. So that way, the abatement uh, district um, director then came to work under uh, the den then director. Um, I can't remember his name. Okay. Yeah, so then they were folded in all together at once. Okay. Thank you. Um, because temporary laborers are the backbone of our field operations, we are always subject to labor market demands and fluctuations, and we expect to see that cost increase. Um, another thing is that we also must be vigilant monitoring for highly invasive Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti species uh, mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that transmit chikungunya and Zika and dengue fever and all kinds of nasty uh, viruses. Uh, typically, they're adapted to tropical climates and um, they found their way up to California and North Carolina. Um, we don't think they can survive here in our climate, but um, Mother Nature often finds ways to prove us wrong. Mm -hmm. So we have to be vigilant in that. And finally, we always have to worry about flooding, but that challenge is part of our normal operations. We are prepared to respond to mosquito abatement demands caused by catastrophic flood events when necessary. The FY 2020 Mosquito Abatement District appropriation is $1,225,824 with 433,190 dollars in personnel expenses, 792,634 in operating expenses. Uh, we have no supplemental requests at this time, and the fund balance for the abatement district is $1,267,291. And with that, Madam Chair, I would once again offer my gratitude to the board and stand for any questions. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate um, your work. I know you run a tight ship over there, and you've been working really diligently on um, shoring up best practices and efficiencies and putting things um, in place where we are measuring outcomes, and really appreciate that. Thank I you, do I have one it. question on how, um, how are you taking the salary costs of the director and deputy director and dividing those amongst the three? So, um, Madam Chair, the, as far as the administrative folks that work in all three departments, each of those folks is designated as a prime, has a designated primary, and they work 800 hours in that primary and the other, um, uh, or, I might have that wrong, 800 hours and 640, right? I'm confused. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't so know they, the number of all hours, the way in the back but, of the room. Yeah. <laughs> they have a primary that they're, uh, most of their salary or, or maybe two thirds is paid out of and then the other third is paid out of the other two. So we rotate, I actually change department funding for each of our admin folks when the time comes. So those are paths that I put through um, and Lori, Miss Lori Beck always tries to remember to keep me straight on that, so. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, anything else for you? No, thank you very much. Thanks for answering along the way. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Phil. All right, Madam Chair. Um, we'll uh, take a break, recess here, maybe till 3 o'clock, just looking at the clock right now. Does that work for you? or? Uh, that gives you a little bit of time. And then when we come back, we'll be doing more uh, broad. So we've gone from the, the individual department level. We'll span back out now and start looking big picture. Great. Would that be Meg? Do you have a question, Commissioner Lachando? I can ask you offline. Okay. All right. See everyone back here at 3. Sure. Thank you. Okay. We are back on the record um, listening to our department budget presentations. And um, next up, we have Meg, who's come to the podium. I don't believe we need Kathleen to give an introduction at this point, so we'll have Meg take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, Phil. Um, the Commissioner asked that I just give a very brief overview of the Master Facility Plan and the Capital um, Project priorities, and so I'm going to go ahead and do that, a brief overview. If you have any um, questions, though, that are specific, feel free to ask. 
we use the master facilities plan to uh, basically wrap our head around all the county, what the county does and has so that we can operate in the most cost effective manner possible. We have 32 facilities and 1.2 million square feet of buildings and over 1,800 employees. So we've grown to a size that requires us to have such a plan um, so that we can operate in the most effective um, and efficient pro uh, way possible. Most of you have heard us talk about the fact that the plan prioritizes these facilities and provides a cost estimate for each facility and forecasts how we would build those out through the year 2025. You have also heard a lot about the top three priority priorities, an expansion to the jail, a new administration building, and a new coroner's facility. The total cost of all 14 um, of the general fund facilities is approximately $317 million, and that was in 2018. But the plan actually has much, much more to it. And I think that the leadership team that participated in that um, will be able to um, attest to that. Um, as you can see by the gentleman in the picture, which I won't name names, um, <laughs> they were very long meetings and a lot of times um, very draining. We got definitely into the weeds, but I think it was necessary. Um, all the elected officials were involved in all the directors. There are six charrettes, um, and in the end product, we created a detailed guide a guidebook for that created a path forward and a very a lot of valuable data. There was a facility audit that was conducted for every building, and projections to the year 2025 in 2040 for FTEs and square footage were determined for each office. Office adjacency needs were analyzed. We discussed centralized versus decentralized services and much, much more. And in the end, what turned out being one of the most valuable accomplishments wasn't in the numbers or data collected but in the fact that everyone came together and thought of Ada County as one whole enterprise and not just their own department or office. So now on to the capital investment program priorities. The two are related the master facilities plan and the capital program. The master facility plan provides for the long-term needs of the county, while the capital program assists in the annual appropriation of funds for those and other needs. The capital program is a means for the larger projects identified in a master facilities plan to request funding for their projects. And we will always highlight these when they're in the capital program because they are such a high priority in the, to the county. They have already been vetted by the county leaders and they have basically a jump start on the architectural programming. Um, however, the capital program only has limited funding available, so other funding sources will be necessary for the majority of the MFP projects. Um, this year, we have received a total of 17 pro capital projects, uh, capital project proposals, with 14 of them requested, requesting full or partial funding through the general funds. So for FY20, the total is um, 5.6 million, and the total for all the projects is 8.6. And that's due to some that have been removed from this list? No, this is the total. The ones that are highlighted are the ones that are in the master facilities plan. Or so number three is the PSB complex, and I can start at the top. The first, and these are how they are ranked by the Transformation Board. Right. I don't, 
I'm I sorry. understand that. I was oh, okay. under, trying to understand the difference between the 8.6 and the total um, down below the general fund 9.5 and 8.6. Oh, Very I bottom. see. Madam Chair, it, the distinction is the other funding sources. So okay. there's, yeah. The general fund versus the non. Got it. Nick, can so, you just quickly, um, briefly speak to the public involvement in this master's facility plan and um, the, I know I'm kind of a little bit late in asking that question. It should have been mm -hmm. on the other slide. But the public was involved in this process? Um, the pu no, it was more of a um, process where we involved, they were involved, we had a public hearing, so yes, they were involved with the public hearing. It was, we'd used more of the um, leadership team that led it, and we, but we did have a public hearing, yes. Do you want me to go through the list of the capital projects? The, I guess I can go through the top couple. The first um, is the courthouse server was the first priority. Um, number two was the more cooler freezer expansion. The third one was the PSB complex expansion, which is part of the master facilities plan. And the fourth one is driver's license, second location. The fifth one is the courthouse audiovisual upgrades. And then the sixth one's a corner, new facility property only. So does this show, this does not show us, does it, um, what we have seen over the last couple of days in terms of specific asks? This is more just a general overview, correct? Uh, no, this does this does show what if people have asked for capital projects that are over a hundred thousand dollars, it includes those. But if they have asked for anything under a hundred thousand, it would not. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, maybe to clarify, so we'll see these, and as we present decisions along the way, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit. Um, we'll constantly remind you of the prioritization given by the Transformation Board. So certainly just advisory, not binding in any way, but it helps give you a tool for these $100,000 and above expenses on, you know, so I'm just picking the, the uh, gel CCU and dorm side visiting changes versus the courthouse server room. After the review by the Transformation Board, the server is much more important in terms of its timeliness um, and the urgency to do it. Um, so. Hopefully that helps in your decision making. The other things, and I think it's what you were referring to, Commissioner Kenny, is the, all those supplemental requests that people have asked for. Mm -hmm. We're also gonna present that information to you, but those have not been ranked or anything. And those are all under under $100,000. Um, departments, and I believe they did, I don't think, I can't think of any exceptions to this, uh, as what Meg was referring to, did present their capital improvement program or extraordinary operating expense re requests, but they also were doing it at the same time that they were all doing those supplemental requests. So we kind of have two tiers that were operating largely ba distinguished by dollar amount. Okay, just trying to track. Yep, understood. <laughs> That's a very reasonable question. Okay, thank you, Meg. Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Clerk McGrain, looking at the EOE proposal, sorry, I've flipped yep. ahead. No, um, that's fine. I was... So remind me, that was budgeted in this current year in FY19, but it's rolling into FY20 pending completion. Will you remind me of the story there? Uh, maybe let me ask, I think I'm following a clarifying question. The, are you, is there a specific one you're referring to or all of them? I'm looking at number one, payroll yeah. time okay. and attendance sure. replacement, sorry. Yeah, great, that's why I figured, I just wanted to clarify. So um, the, uh, the payroll time and attendance, yeah, the money was appropriated this year and it will roll over next year. So realistically, that $1,750,000 is in this budget and has already been allocated. So it's not, the only request is for an additional 250,000, I say only, but uh, <laughs> the additional request is for $250,000 to be added. Um, but you're right, this won't, um, we've discussed this and we'll uh, talk about it here. 
that actually won't impact our budget very much in terms of making decisions because we have fund balance already reserved for this. So we're not gonna be asking for new money. It's just rolling that money over into a next operating year. And then a question you didn't ask, but similar to the CIP, these extraordinary operating expenses, again, are over $100,000. There's just a distinction this year where that we broke up what are capital, like capital investments versus operational funds. And that was something that was led by Meg and her team. Yeah, that's correct. Phil, going back to, you said um, out of the 1,750,000, mm -hmm. is it already There's, allocated? No, 1.75. Okay. Yeah, one, one point seven five million dollars is already allocated. Okay. There's a request for an additional $250,000 to where round that, it up to two. Where would that be reflected? That was reflected, that's not showing here because it was added uh, after your books were produced. This is that when Mitra uh, at the beginning gave an overview, there were some amendments, like the ones that were removed, mm -hmm. that yeah. $250,000 is added. That's why it's not reflected on your paperwork at the moment. Um, but we have updated it on our sheets uh, in terms of going through the questions. And that was the one where based on the RFP process that's currently being conducted, the need for the change was recommended because of that. Okay. So I just want to verify that with the, all the capital projects, um, one through 14, that all of these are somewhere reflected in our budget presentations at one time over the last couple of days, or are there some that have been omitted? I believe. I believe so. I believe I've, all of them have been reflected. I've the seen them. I'm looking through operations, yes. The sheriff, yes. The coroner, yes. Parks, yes. Yep, I've seen all those in the all presentations. Come through. Okay, yep. and same with the extraordinary. Payroll, sheriff, operations, clerk, IT, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's easier for me to capture all of them on one or two pages versus yeah. the binder. <laughs> And then these are just the recommendation the transformation board makes. You don't have to follow these, you know, in this order, but it's a recommendation the transformation board makes. Yeah. Okay. And then, like I said, the highlighted ones are just, they're, they're, they have additional information that's already been gathered in the master facilities plan, so they already have the programmatic data behind them. So... And that's all right. all I have. Thank you. That was helpful you. to yeah, circle back. Okay. Meg, if you could get me um, Mitra's original when we started the budget process, and I'll put this, so the this packet so okay. then I have yeah. the changes all in one place. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions? Um, process Next. wise, yeah. okay. let's, talk, let's talk deliberations. Yeah, Give next step. So we're going to shift gears here, Madam Chair. I think you can already feel it from the dialogue that just happened. Uh, for the most part, up to this point, I've been sitting here listening uh, along. And uh, the rest of the conversation moving forward is going to largely be between, be between you as the commission and Kathleen and myself um, throughout the process. So you're going to hear me speak a lot more and Kathleen speak a lot more as we guide through the decisions into the deliberative process. Um, because. Now we've heard all the collective requests. Um, we know what the ask is. Uh, now we have the, the challenging decision of allocating the funding that we do have. Um, we're, we've been monitoring and looking at what funding is available. I'm here in a minute, Kathleen will give a refresher update, kind of she did at the beginning. She'll do that again here in just a minute. Um, but that's what we're gonna shift through. So a uh, couple of uh, things in terms of the process moving forward. Um, uh, Tomorrow, uh, we'll have a meeting of the elected officials just to have a conversation among elected officials regarding the budget, um, whatever questions or dialogue there is to help in that kind of policy setting. And then be, really, it will kick off the deliberative process on June 17th. Um, and we have that week, we have times allotted throughout that week, just like we did this week, uh, where we will be convening. The time that's allotted throughout that week is uh, very fluid and flexible. It, like. Arguably, we could show up on Monday morning and in an hour. We could have a balanced budget and move forward, like just hypothetically. Um, uh, or we could be here Friday afternoon. Uh, it's up to you how you want to spend that Friday afternoon. 
Uh, so uh, we'll be working <laughs> through. Hope you don't have vacation plans. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what we'll be working through, and we have, um, so here in a minute we'll walk through that. A couple things, though, before we get to, uh, to that. Um, uh, we had talked about public participation. Commissioner Laciando, you had uh, triggered that. Um, I have with me a draft press release. I'll give you each a copy real quick. Historically, our primary point of public participation has been comments provided at the public budget presentation that happens in July, um, but that's late in the process. That's when we have a proposed balanced budget that we're considering adopting tentatively. Um, we'll still do that piece that is statutorily required, um, but what we've done here is we've also added, based on your feedback, um, is proposed sending out this release tomorrow, which lets the public know, one, that we've had these presentations. There are, the videos are available on our um, uh, YouTube site, so if anyone wants to see, <laughs> and that they can email in any comment and feedback between now and June 18th. That way we get it on the front end so it can be uh, assistive in the deliberative process. And then also opening up a window of time on Monday, June 17th, so when we start the deliberative process, um, what we were able to identify based on the calendaring that we have was from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We wanted to offer a, a wide enough span of time that there's some flexibility for the public's sake. Um, so we'll take testimony. We may just continue with our dialogue, and then whenever someone from the public shows up to participate, we can allow them to step up and provide comment. But that way it's happening on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, so that it can inform your decisions Better. rather than reacting to your decisions uh, as we go along the way. Um, so hopefully that, if you guys are okay with that, um, tomorrow we'll take steps and we'll publicize this and make sure the public's aware. Madam Chair, uh, Phil, I, I think this is great. I'd love to have it be a little bit more um, articulated when someone might expect to show up, how much time they would be allotted rather than just whenever they may happen to show up, I think we okay. might want to be a little bit more specific, like 10, from 10 to 11, okay. what, what have you, so people know. Yep. Okay, we can flesh that out before okay. it goes out. But does the general concept in terms of that mm -hmm. window of time? No, I really appreciate that. I think you know once we get to July, the cake's kind of baked, so it's, it's good to have it on the front end. <laughs> yep, and I don't anticipate this necessarily being anything. If for some reason, uh, through the uh, deliberative process we were to consider the use of foregone uh, an independent hearing would have to be held with public comment for that purpose right. that's but that's only in the instance uh, that that was taken into consideration at this point I mean, we'll, I'll defer that to you but I don't anticipate that so far um, uh, but we'll we'll get this out and then this also allows the opportunity for people to email in feedback and not just have I recognize work schedules and other things uh, that may not be allowed so we'll compile all that information and then be able to present it to you as part of the deliberations as well. Um, with that, I'll first turn it over to Kathleen to give that overview again of where we are big picture. Okay. And then once Kathleen has done that, and I've got some handouts for you to go along with Kathleen's presentation, what we'll do is we'll pull up on the screen um, as again, it could, partly as a reminder, but just so you can see some of the tools we'll be using during deliberations so that you can kind of anticipate and be thinking about what walking through that's going to be like. Paper is always helpful. Yep. Do you all need to Hello, Madam Chair, <laughs> are you ready to I think delve ready. through this again? Yes, All righty. Thank you. Appreciate so, you come circling back around with yep, us on this. Certainly. So we're going to look at uh, kind of where we are, uh, started with the budgets as submitted for the departments. This is looking countywide. So this is every fund, um, whether it's a special revenue fund, your special taxing districts, general fund, or the 3% cap funds. So right now, as submitted, the funding of 279,261,930 exceeds the expenditures of 273,585,270 by 
uh, 5,676,660. Uh, we did add, so you can see in your handout, you've got all those numbers there for what um, the departmental revenue uh, started out to be uh, as far as a base of 113,513,527. The additional departmental revenue for FY20, 5,608,902. Property tax base, 133,611,397. What the 3% of property tax will give us, the 4,012,048. The new construction roll, uh, 5,469,390. And the use of fund balance right now for all of those departments currently, 17,046,666. Personnel budget, 167,936,565. Operating, 81,830,336. One-time capital projects submitted within the department budgets, 23 million eight eighteen three sixty nine. Madam Chair, uh, Kathleen, so when you say submitted within the department budgets, all CIP plus, no, no not CIP. No, not CIP, okay. not EOE, not Colomerit. Okay. Now we're going to watch to see what happens to okay. that surplus number. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> the show goes on here. All righty. We're going to look at merit first. If we put in 3% merit, oh, let me try again. Party foul. Hmm? There we go. That surplus of 5 million drops to 1,518,095. Again, uh, the merit is, is 4,153 over the course of all county funds. Adding in the capital investment program, the CIP, those big ticket items. That's 4.46. We now have a deficit of 2,949,185. And then if we add in the operating extraordinary operational expenses, which equated to 4.9 million, we have a deficit of 7,892,850 that we have to overcome. Now, the numbers for the CIP and the extraordinary operating that you're seeing here, they are part of the handout that Meg did, Meg gave you everything. These numbers are just those items in red. So the ones that are the high priority, that's where we came, came with that. If we added in everything, we would, we would have double digit deficit. So Madam Chair, uh, Phil, Kathleen, when we walk through this next week, you have mentioned decision points and the decision points are not just on CIP and EOE. Right. right. It's also supplementals, it's new positions. So where does that, how does that happen? Well, it just so happens. So, um, and I think it's fair both for you as well as the public, anyone watching. So this is a really broad strokes overview. Like we just lumped what you just saw, Kathleen, and all the CIP, when instead you're going to take them individually and look at each project on its merits. Mm -hmm. um, so we have it broken down to a, through the delivery process on a much more granular scale. This is just helping us show. Um, also, I think on that graphic, um, you see the seven point, effectively $7.9 million deficit there. Um, we do need to come up with a balanced budget, but one of the ways we will balance the budget is some of our uh, needs are one-time expenses where we will use savings. So we may show a deficit when we're working through this, but that deficit will just be filled by the use of savings because we don't capture savings as a revenue stream. It's just, that's how we balance the so budget. So fund balance, so that's our fund screen balance, that yes, exactly. looks red or green. Yeah, green, yes, okay. yeah, green precisely, right yes, exactly. Nope. That's green. So we won't necessarily be making decisions from this tool because there are a lot of different decision points along here that we would have to get through. Um, we're kind of still up in the air on that, but we're thinking that we will probably use the tools here uh, for you to make decisions where we can actually record your decision and have it as a, as a document that we keep. Not that we can't for the toolkit as well, but this is just you know yeah. maybe um, to we will be using both, both simultaneously. right we will be using both we will tracking yes. your decisions basically two sources kathleen's documenting it in this excel spreadsheet which she uses to record the history and we can always one of the things that we've had to do in the past and we will likely have to do uh, in this instance we will go through collectively as a board you will make a decision so let's just uh look here at the first the not this one They're yeah it's probably page. not a good go one but uh, so the payroll time and attendance replacement, we make a decision. 
um, we may go through the process and we'll be tracking it on that sliding scale. We'll get done going through decisions and see, oh, we still have too large of a deficit or we don't feel comfortable. We can revisit and amend any decision that has been made. They're not, you know, it, it, the, we'll do a comprehensive total at the end and say, okay, everyone's good with where we sit. Um, that'll be the final phase, but we'll be tracking them. And one of the things, if you could flip back to Tableau real quick, hmm. Kathleen. Um, just like what I'm doing right now, throughout the process during deliberations, there may be times either as an individual you request us to look back just to see where we kind of stand, or like before a break, we may revisit and just show you, based on all the decisions we just went through, here's where we sit, because this scale helps give you a, a comfort of are we making progress or not um, along the way. Okay. And then um, will department heads and elected officials be present um, during the process so we can ask questions? Um, generally, it will be depend. I'm gonna say don't rely on that necessarily. We ask and we will send out a message that they be available okay. so that we can so follow up. That doesn't mean they'll be in the room to come stand at the podium, but it means that we can follow up quickly and get a response to your question. Uh, and we have staff. We'll clarification, yeah. sure, for things along the way. Yeah, we have staff in the auditor's office that can chase down some of those answers for you. Um, also, there will be instances, as you already see right at the moment, there are some department heads or representatives in the audience, and I won't be surprised, especially some of the larger ones, that they will have representation here. Okay. Whether it, that person will be able to determine whether they feel comfortable answering on behalf of the department. But most of the conversation is no longer going to be between you and the departments. It'll be mostly with us in this public setting trying to make decisions. So one of the things, I think one of the challenges you will experience, you already probably know this, but sometimes we will not have perfect information or all the information, but we still have to, we're tasked with ultimately coming up with a balanced budget. And so we'll be working through that together to hopefully get you the tools you need to make a decision. Thank you. Yeah. Are there other questions in advance of that process? I mean, we'll have a week off so you can process all of your, look through your notes and process things, um, but it will, what you're gonna see a big shift is from listening to us asking you questions, right? So Shark Tank's gonna flip, uh, and you get to make the decisions of yay or nay on, on various projects and requests overall. Um, any, and even the things, so the decisions that you see uh, that we have noted, they will be the supplementals, the CIP, the EOE, um, they will also be any uh, personnel related decisions, so that could be anything from an individual uh, increase for a special salary adjustment or a new position. Um, we'll go through, some will probably be pretty easy because their revenue is identified and we'll go through them. Um, one of the things we're not revisiting in detail is anything that's built into that base budget that someone did. That doesn't mean we can't review it, it's just not an, a pre-identified decision-making tool. So if there's some department or topic you wanna revisit, just please let us know and we'll bring it up. And we have the tools to tee up anything. Um, but we're kind of helping, we've narrowed it down to what are the big decisions that need to be made to help you come up with a balanced budget. Will, will Cassie be presenting this piece? Uh, we will be presenting this piece, but Cassie, as she has been throughout this, will be here uh, and her team present. So if there's questions related to one of them, um, she's, her office has reviewed all of these back in April uh, when they were submitted. So they have been seen by both auditors. We look at them for the financials. She looks at them for all the HR reasons. Um, but we, we work together uh, to, to build this. Okay. So I would say on the personnel, uh, we would be looking for a decision on all the personnel requests, whether they're within the budget, within their allocation, or if they were supplementals. So you'll see the, color, the different coloring here. Mm -hmm. Anything that's gray is a request that was, was able to be funded within their budget, but we still need you to say yes or no to that. Uh, anything that's blue is a transfer, either transfer out and then transfer into some other department. Orange are your new requests or your supplementals that you have all the detail to in your books. And then at the bottom, um, Cassie has, we did work with Cassie and there were a handful, I don't know, maybe 20, way at the bottom here, keep going, that um, she wanted added in as decision points. You have not necessarily seen these but these are um, changes that she would like to see in the budget and we'll be asking, and she can speak to, to these if you have questions. I don't know if you have any information on them or not. We did not provide it in your budget book, but 
Uh, we'll ask, also be asking those you see down here, the two uh, sheriff's deputies that we had talked about for security here in the building. They have been added. Um, so we'll go through all of this, uh, the supplementals that Phil alluded to. They are all here for you. Um, we've made notes out to the side right now on like the ones we no longer need, but we need to still keep them here because that's what was submitted. So like this uh, one for the assessor, uh, those premiums changed. We no longer need this. So we could actually, we'll say no. And when we update the budget, we'll remove that from their budget. Um, just some other information for us and cut 150,000 here. Some things have come in after budgets were submitted. So we've add, added those like the courthouse security, the sheriff's deputy equipment and gear. That was added in after the budgets were submitted. Um, there are a handful of others. The impact fee study that you had requested, what that cost was, additional from Valley Regional Transit. And then Public Health submitted their final um, request that had a small adjustment to that. And then we have the CIP that um, Meg and Mitra have gone over, just listing some different things here that we'll ask you to make a decision on. Again, the numbers that we've gone by and that we've given you are only those in the red. That does not mean that you can't add the yellow, but they aren't in the numbers that we did. We do have this um, number 11. This is the one Scott was talking about that he wants to add, take off a of CIP and put in his budget that would be funded with his fund balance. And EOE, the same thing. These two projects, uh, you know, can be removed. So we'll remove, we'll have you, you know, make a formal decision on that. There's the additional 250 for payroll. And then um, the digitization of uh, historic records, you know, the 533 that we have restricted right now for that. And then the additional ask of 396, 533. If you request that, we'll put that in there and then that will be the decision point. So those are the things that we'll be making decisions on as well as one of the things that's kind of an anomaly here that we would like your decisions on. These are annual appropriations. So um, I don't know if you want me to give you a little information on this now or if you want to wait until. Let's uh, wait till the deliberative yeah. process. Yeah. This is a this relatively is a kind minor of an anomaly. thing that we're going to be doing. Yeah. It's, a, it's just a, a formality. Step. Yep. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not going to change anything one way or another. Okay. Hopefully through this you can see we're keeping really healthy track and very small detail and then we'll kind of walk through and then be able to revisit but uh, know that we'll be there to kind of guide through the process as we go so that we can talk about anything and, and navigate through it. There's a lot of small decisions that will add up to one big decision ultimately. Kathleen, how many years have you been doing this? Well, doing this job specifically, maybe 10. I've been with the county for longer than that, though. Well, we'll re rely a lot heavily on filling in the holes and plugging information for us because I'm sure you've not memorized the entire binder yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? No, I don't think I, so. I think at this point um, we'll get word out to the public uh, regarding their opportunity to participate uh, between now and then. And then uh, beginning on the 17th, uh, we'll be prepared to start asking questions and making decisions to get to a balanced budget. And please, anything that comes up in the interim, if you have any questions about the budget or you're reviewing something, uh, please take advantage of uh, uh, reaching out to either myself or Kathleen or anyone else from our team. Great, thank you. I just wanted to um, just share our appreciation for all the department heads and all the elected officials in preparing their budgets. And we know it was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work, and there were some excellent presentations. And it really um, helped us to get to know each of you a little bit better and the nuances of your departments. Um, it's Ada County, as you know, is quite large and it's really difficult for two of us to get around to, to talk to everyone and, and meet and greet. And um, this was really an eye opener for me to see just how much um, all of you are out there doing. And like uh, Scott said, with very lean teams of, you know, in a lot of situations here. So really appreciate your efforts and we will do our best. It's not gonna be pretty but we will do our best. <laughs> Thank you. Any words, last words? We're good? No, looking forward to it. Uh, thanks, everyone. And, um, you know, appreciate the trust that you've put in us. Uh, well, maybe you didn't know that you were putting trust in us, but now you are. And uh, <laughs> look, for late. look forward to this process going forward. Don't forget Faces Block Party at 5. Head on over, okay?
Cool. All right, let's adjourn for the day for the presentations.